Francisca Sverd. Francisca is born in 69 in Berlin. Uh, she has studied in Berlin and has a master in German studies, Slavic studies, and Seattle studies. She has also studied in Moscow uh, at the Russian Academy for Theater Arts called Gitis between 1993 and 1994. She currently lives in Potsdam, in Germany, of course, and translates Russian literature into German. She has worked in theater and documentary film, as well as in German-Russian cultural exchanges. She has also worked as a freelance for several uh, theater in Berlin, as research and location manager and documentaries for German and Austrian TV, as an author of radio features. From 2006 to 2012, beside her work as a translator, she has been a performer in theater project by Rimini Protocol, who has uh, performed several times in uh, Théâtre de Vidi. I've seen uh, several of their shows, it's uh, fantastic. She has translated works by Sergei Lebedev, Dmitry Glukovsky, Dina Rubina, Shamshad Abdulayev, Halina Toptovska, <laughs> and the Belarusian Sasha Filipenko. I mentioned him because we just met him at the Fondation Yen Michalski, and others. Thank you very much, Sophie. Um, I thought, first of all, I would like to talk a little bit about what, is be, uh, what it is to be a translator. Probably this is not so well known. Everybody has an imagination, what is the life of a writer, of a poet. But uh, the translators, the literary translators, they are always a little bit in a shadow um, of, of the writers. And probably it would be interesting to learn something more about it. In my generation and the generation before, it was uh, not really used that a trans, uh, literary translator has uh, studies, especially in this um, uh, subject. So uh, often translators were before some, did some literary studies or anything else. Sometimes uh, it was even though, or it is even though, that especially when translating poetry, um, the translator even does not know the original language and works with uh, some interlinear translation made by somebody who knows the language very well. And, um, and often a translator is also a writer himself, like uh, for instance Harry Rowold, and uh, he was a writer and a translator as well. And nowadays it's maybe a little bit, a little bit different, uh, um, especially for Germany. So nowadays you can already in your university studies uh, just learn how really to translate texts of literature very proper. And um, yeah, and then when you decided to be a, a translator, the first steps probably are not so easy because uh, um, usually publishing houses, um, they like to work with, um, with translators who have already experience. But when you're just a beginner, you do not have really experience. So this is a, a very first step, what is probably not so easy. In my case, uh, it was the same actually. So I had really some years where um, when I was working uh, in other fields, like uh, Sophie already mentioned, but uh, from the nowadays perspective, I think it was even better for me because um, when I was younger, of course, I was also interested to, in to see the world, to communicate with people directly. Of course, translating is also a kind of dialogue with the text you want to translate, with the author in a way. But actually, you like, a, the, like the writer it's, uh, himself, you're sitting in front of the computer all the day. And when you are young, it's probably not so easy. So actually, um, for me, it was OK that um, in the first years, I also had a lot of jobs to do beside. Um, yeah, uh, to talk a little bit about the process of uh, translation. Um, I, uh, there's a very nice comparison, Sophie knows it already, um, to compare uh, the, the, the process of um, translation with dancing. So it's like a dance when uh, the original uh, leads. 
<laughs> so um, uh, the original uh, makes a first step, and then you, as you as a translator, you follow the steps of the original. And of course, um, you have to take some freedom. Uh, there's another uh, bon mot by a very well-known in Germany translator. Um, he's he's uh, now not alive, but he was very famous. Karl Didetius, he translated a lot from Polish literature to German literature, and uh, he did, in this way, he did very much for the communication between Poland and Germany. What was after all what happened in the 20th century, not so easy, but uh, he really did a very good thing for, for these both countries and cultures. And he had this uh, bon mot uh, that uh, translation is like a woman. Um, uh, either she's beautiful or she's faithful. So uh, that means uh, if, a, if a translation is very faithful, if it's really repeating every word of the original, it's not really beautiful as you can imagine. So you really have, as a, as a translator, you really have to create a, a meta-language and just to put, put from this meta-language uh, all what you read in the original, to put it in your own language, in, your, in the context of uh, your culture, that you can be understood uh, and that the author can be very, very well understood. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's uh, even not surprising that uh, sometimes a book uh, gains a second existence by in this way. And sometimes the second existence is even more successful than the first existence in the original. Um, and the author I would like to present to you now, uh, with, uh, who I have translated a lot, it's, it's a case like this. This is Sergei Lebedev, uh, a rather young Russian author. He um, is translated into 20 languages, uh, but not very well known in Russia itself. Uh, he was born in um, 81 in Moscow, and in young years he was a lot on um, uh, uh, geological uh, expeditions in uh, Central Asia and in Siberia, and all these travels had probably a big influence on his debut. Uh, his first novel, what was published uh, in 2012 in the German translation uh, in 2013. Uh, there's also um, uh, English translation, of course, Oblivion is the title, and there's a French translation, uh, La Limite de l'Oubli. Um, uh, also, other novels by Sergei Lebedev are translated into French, like uh, L'année de la Comète, um, uh, Les Hommes uh, de Lut, and in, in, in this year there appeared uh, Le Débutant. And this, is, this last novel uh, is a little bit different from the other ones. It's more like a thriller and dealing with all these subjects about Skripal and uh, security service in Russia and so on. But um, now I would like to tell some words about his first novel, from which you afterwards will hear uh, a little piece of the French translation by uh, Luba Jogensen. Um, uh, limit, uh, la limite uh, d'oubli, um, oblivion, predil uh, zavvenia in Russian. Uh, this is a, actually a gulag story told by uh, from the perspective of a young man who did not live in those days. Uh, so as, uh, as he's a child even, uh, he's with his parents uh, on the dacha and uh, then there he has an accident and he's in a hospital and needs uh, blood to be saved and the blood is given by an old neighbor he, who's called grandfather too. And so after giving this blood there's a, a kind of connection between this uh, first boy and then young man and this old man and when the old man dies he heritated him his flat and everything and so he, he, he did, not, it did not really like him but he feels the necessity as he was saved by this old man just to find out more about his uh, biography because he never was talking about himself. And so he uh, does a very big research, uh, he travels to Siberia and so on and he finds all the places 
where in former times had been the gulags. And uh, then he finds out that this uh, grandfather too was a commander in, in one of these uh, gulags and uh, that there's, there's connected a very dark history about that I won't tell you now. So actually I really recommend you this novel mm -hmm. uh, by Sergei Lebedev and now uh, I will read a little piece in, in Russian just for the sound and uh, then um, Sophie is so kind to read uh, the beginning of the novel in French. Здесь кончается Европа. Берег убивает, словно континент съеживается, и ты впервые чувствуешь, что мировой остров не выдумка английских романтических геополитиков начала минувшего века. Ты ожишаешь его границу, совпадающую с линией берега. Ты прибыл сюда из тайги и тундры, чтобы увидеть, как колесовые столбы узнать мир, Породивший атлантов, который держит сумрачный небосвод твоей родины, вдохнуть из уст Гибральтара животворящий воздух легких Среднеземного моря. Но встрети не с растения этого мира, а его край. Для родившегося в России здесь по-прежнему предел ойкумены, как то полагали древние греки. Je me trouve à l'extrémité de l'Europe. Ici, on voit, à nu, dans chaque falaise, l'os jaune de la pierre et une terre ocre ou flamboyante, semblable à de la chair. La pierre s'effrite sous l'assaut des vagues, la chair s'érode sous les marées. L'œil ne peut embrasser l'immensité. L'océan semble renverser celui qui le regarde et menace de faire éclater ses prunelles comme les hublots d'un bateau pour se répandre à l'intérieur, inonder le cerveau. Émergerait alors, sortant des flots tels les pics de Madère et des îles Canaries, quelques rares pensées. Elles porteraient sur le grand attrait de l'absence sur la vacuité de l'horizon qui aspire à être transcendé, tiré de l'eau par l'imagination, nouvelle Atlantide. Un continent où tout est inconnu, où l'espace ignore la boussole et le compas du cartographe. Ici finit l'Europe. La rive s'est rétrécie, le continent paraît se rétracter, et tu sens pour la première fois que l'île-monde n'est pas une invention d'un géopoliticien romantique anglais du début du XXe siècle. Tu sens sa limite qui se confond avec la ligne du rivage. Tu es venu de la taïga et de la toundra pour voir les colonnes d'Hercule, pour connaître l'univers et en donner naissance aux Atlantes qui soutiennent le sombre firmament de ta patrie, pour aspirer par la bouche du Gibraltar, l'air vivifiant des poumons de la Méditerranée. Or, ce n'est pas le cœur de ce monde que tu as rencontré, mais son extrémité. Qui est né en Russie, situe toujours ici la limite de l'Ekoumen, à l'instar des Grecs anciens. Cette limite est en elle-même un défi. Il n'est d'autre vie, de vie nouvelle, au-delà de ces eaux anonymes comme la mort. La terre ferme est un déploiement continu que l'océan interrompt, exigeant de nous un effort spirituel, un grand dessin au nom duquel nous serions capables de renoncer à la solidité familière du sol sous nos pieds, de monter à bord d'un navire tangant. Je me tiens sur cette lisière qui invite à faire un pas en avant, mais pour cela, il eût fallu que j'y vienne le cœur léger et l'âme libre. Or, mon âme et mon cœur sont pleins de la mémoire des espaces qui s'étendent vers le cercle polaire, de leur mutisme qui a soif de mots, de la blancheur de cette neige qui vous mange les yeux, blancheur d'une feuille inentamée et du noir, semblable à celui brillant du charbon qui attend de se transformer en chaleur des flammes. 
noir de la nuit, noir de la mine dont l'air, appauvri par chaque respiration, ne connaît pas de jour. Venu ici, au bout du monde, je n'ai pas mon dessin devant, mais derrière moi. Je dois me retourner. Mon voyage est fini. J'entame mon trajet de retour vers les mots. Je me sens sensation soudaine, mais longuement mûrie. Plus européen que les habitants de ce pays qui regardent l'Atlantique comme on regarde la rue de son balcon. J'ai séjourné à l'autre bout de cette Europe dont les saillies rocheuses surplombent les marécages de la Sibérie occidentale. J'ai vu l'obscur arrière-cour du continent européen, ses annexes finaux ou griennes, ses arrières, son fondement. Je me suis tenue sur les monts de l'Oural, au-delà du cercle polaire, là où se rejoignent l'Europe et l'Asie. Là-bas, sur le versant européen, ne poussent que des bouleaux polaires, petits et entortillés par les vents, tandis que du côté asiatique s'élèvent des cèdres puissants dont les racines brisent la pierre. Dans le ciel, au-dessus des montagnes, s'affrontent les orages des deux grandes plaines. Et ça s'arrête là. Mmh. <rires>